Welcome back to ECE 442-542. The next time you come to this classroom is the exam. I hope that surprises no one. We will have a review session for Wednesday's exam immediately following this class and you'll have to pack up as will I and move over a building into education and that's in room 353. Hopefully I can do that in the time frame that we've allotted which is to have that starting at 7 o'clock. It may be a little bit later than that but we'll try to get it right at 7 or shortly thereafter. As far as exam number one is concerned, there is material on D2L and I have added just a little bit to that. You had the list of topics for exam number one, but you also now have reading. If you want to go and try to read or find more practice problems, I've tried to identify in the Shams out outline textbook what you could be reading. It's basically chapters one through seven in Shams, except it's selected sections in chapter four, five, six, and it's actually all of chapter seven. Chapter seven is block diagram algebra, and you should be able to do that. But it tries to identify certain sections in the Shams outline that you could read if you wanted to between now and the first exam or the final exam. It's all cumulative. So it won't be wasted effort if you read that material now or in the future. Today what I want to do is really deal with the region of convergence, which won't be on the exam. I shouldn't have said that, should I? Now half of the class has gone and left. But it will be on a subsequent exam. Really to deal with the region of convergence, the reason why we're interested in, in that is for inverse Z transforming. And inverse Z transforming won't be a part of exam one. We will be doing Z transforms. Speaking of that, on the review material in exam number one, pay attention to the heading on those practice exams. It's not all of exam two from a previous semester. It may be particular problems from those exams. I'm getting emails saying, what's this zero order hold equivalent? We haven't covered that. That's correct. At least you're realizing what we are or are not covering in this class. We will cover it, but for exam one, that won't be a part of exam one. Pay attention to the material topics or the problem numbers on those headings in D2L. The one exam that is complete is last year's exam, spring 2014. That's fairly representative of what we've covered this semester. So that should be somewhat accurate. In addition to region of convergence, which I will give us the 30,000 foot version originally, or initially, the big picture, what do we mean by the region of convergence and what can we be expecting to see for our region of convergence? And there's really only three patterns that we need to worry about or be thinking about. And then we'll go through specific examples with the region of convergence. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the process for exam number one, what you can and can't do or bring and not bring for exam one. Here are the cans. You're allowed one sheet of notes, front and back, but that's restricted to eight and a half inches by 11 inches. Hopefully I put those marks on that. So don't bring in a poster board for your notes. You can bring in a Z-transform table and that can be from D2L or if you have your own, I'm going to go ahead and allow that if you have a favorite Z transform table, but just make sure it's one page extra for the Z transform material. You can bring a calculator and I'm not going to screen those calculators. It's whatever calculator you have and something to write with because I probably won't bring 85 pencils to supply you to work your exam. You can't bring a computer, your cell phone, textbooks. You can bring them, but I may have you hide those or put those underneath your chair. 
and there are no class notes other than that one page of notes that you can bring. We'll talk more about exam number one at the review session as far as the topics and work through some of those problems. Question? Do the notes have to be handwritten? I'm going to screen all 85 of those as you walk in the door on Wednesday. No. So I'm not going to be checking whether they are handwritten, whether they're in microfiche, but you need to be able to understand your own notes. I've had students, well, I won't give you any clues as to your notes, but you can type those up if you want. You can typeset those at a six-point font, I guess, and then you basically do have the textbook since we don't have a textbook for this class, right? Other questions? Did that answer your question? The notes, your one page of notes do not necessarily have to be handwritten. Other questions on the exam? We'll deal with that in an hour and a half as far as the specifics of exam number one. Let's now move into material that won't be on the exam directly, but it will be maybe helpful in terms of understanding. When we start talking about Oh, we might as well talk about rocks since it's the gem and mineral show. And you can get into this, well, I guess this venue is not free of charge, is it? You had to pay tuition, so you're attending now a rock performance. Region of Convergence, ROC. So if you see ROC, that's the Region of Convergence. And how does that relate or not relate to stability. These are actually two different things. The region of convergence does not imply stability. You can find the region of convergence independent of a stability discussion, and that's what I want you to be clear on. And to start, let's look at this or these concepts on the region of convergence from a big picture perspective. First, let me write a couple of sentences. First, the region of convergence is determined independent of any stability considerations. You find that region of convergence that determines when this infinite sum converges. That's what determines the region of convergence. You're not talking about the stability of the waveform or of the system. You're finding the region of convergence so that that expression, capital X of Z, actually exists. What values of Z allow that capital X of Z to exist. However, a signal is bounded and this, now I'm playing with this or because capital X of Z could correspond to a signal or it could correspond to a system. What is this transform representing? It could represent a signal, or it could represent a system. So that's why I'm using this or. However, a signal is bounded, or a system is stable, if the region of convergence, or if it's corresponding region of convergence contains the unit circle. Meaning if the unit circle lies within the region of convergence, 
then you have a stable si signal or a bounded signal in a stable system. And we'll hopefully make that clear as we go through this. Here's a fact that I hope that if you start sketching a region of convergence and you put poles interior to your region of, con or inside or within your region of convergence, you know you've made a mistake. Here's the fact, poles never lie, and I'm going to say within the region of convergence. Because I'm going to be talking about interior, exterior. When I say within, if you've shaded in the z-plane where your region of convergence is, so you have a shaded region in your z-plane, you better not have x's or poles in that shaded region. That's what I'm trying to say here. And I hope that's clear from my description. It may not be clear from this description. Within means it's you can't have poles in that shaded region where the shaded region represents your region of convergence. Let's now talk about three possible region of convergence patterns. Again, this is the big picture and these patterns we can actually talk about independent of stability. We can determine stability once we have a pattern and poles in place, but we don't have to worry about stability if we're just worrying about region of convergence. Here's pattern number one. Pattern number one, and I'm going to give this, each of these patterns, three different pieces. I'm going to have a picture, then I will have a word description, and then I will, what am I calling it, the implication of these ideas. Here is the picture, and this is a picture in the z-plane. And I will try to keep things consistent. Here is our z-plane axis in green. The imaginary z and the real z. And the region of convergence, I'm going to try to keep that in blue. And the poles, I'm going to draw in black. What's shaded is the region of convergence. The poles, I hope it's clear, they are interior to the region of convergence. All of these poles are interior to this page that has the middle cut out of it. And the cut out portion is where the poles are and everything else, the non cut out, is the region of convergence. Here's what I'm going to try to use to describe that. Here's the description of this pattern. And I'm going to say it two ways. The first way is pattern IA, which says that the region of convergence lies beyond all of the poles. That's one way of trying to phrase this or describe that. Or another way of saying that might be all poles are interior to the region of convergence. Okay. And the implication is that this signal, let's call it x of n, that corresponds to these poles
is right-sided, and by that I'm meaning if you had a time domain picture of x of n, now all of these, whether these are stable or not, whether they're going unbounded or they are bounded, that's not an issue. They're all pertaining to non-negative values of n when I say they're right-sided. Here's zero as far as n is concerned. Here's one, two, three, etc. That's one way of saying the implication or we could say that x of n is equal to zero for all negative indices little n. That's if we have this region of convergence that's beyond all of our poles. That's pattern number one. Pattern number two. Again, we'll draw the picture in the z-plane. And my region of convergence was blue, wasn't it? There's my region of convergence and all of my poles are not in the region of convergence and they're actually outside or lie beyond. So that's the picture in the z-plane. The description for pattern number two is 2a, which says that the region of convergence lies inside all poles, or another way of trying to word that or describe that is that all poles are exterior. To the region of convergence. And the implication of this second pattern is that x of n as a time sequence is just the opposite of pattern one. This one's now left-sided, or you could say that x of n is equal to zero for all non-negative arguments in. Meaning here the picture for time now all of these values of non-zero little x's are for negative indices on n. That's this left-sided picture. That's pattern two. One more pattern is all we have, which is pattern three. So there's really not that much to keep track of on region of convergence. It's not that complicated is what I hope you leave today's lecture thinking. Here is the picture for this pattern. And these are supposed to be concentric circles. And now we have p 
poles that are interior to the region of convergence and some that are exterior to the region of convergence. And this region of convergence is annular or it's donut shaped or it's bagel shaped. You pick your favorite annular food item. I shouldn't be talking food since it's dinner time, but here is the description of this pattern. 3A is that the region of convergence is annular or donut shaped. That's the first way of potentially describing it. Or the second is that some poles and that could be a pole, so some poles or one pole are interior to the region of convergence and some poles are exterior to the region of convergence. And here the implication is that this sequence x of n is not right sided or left sided, it's both. It's two sided. Little x of n is a two sided sequence or x of n is non-zero for n greater than or equal to zero and n negative. means that and we could have this sequence decaying or bounded on one side and growing on the other. They could both be decaying, they could both be growing. And it all depends on where this annular region is relative to the unit circle. And I didn't yet put the unit circle anywhere on those patterns, did I? You didn't see the unit circle in any of those patterns. So the, unit, the region of convergence is determined, and then you figure out where's the, re, where's the unit circle relative to that region of convergence. Question. So the question is, how close are these poles to the region of convergence? And they are actually right on the boundary. The poles determine the boundary of the region of convergence. I may not have sketched it very well, but the inner circle is bounded by the largest radius of the poles that's interior. The exterior annular portion is bounded by the smallest pole that is on the exterior of those of that circle. So the poles are going to bound our region of convergence, whether it's this pattern, pattern three, where it's annular. If it's pattern one, that pole that's on the right is the furthest away from the origin, and that's establishing the size of the interior circle of our region of convergence for this pattern. And on the second pattern, 
This one's maybe a little bit better drawn than all the others. This one is bounding the overall size of how big is that region of convergence relative to the origin. But you'll go out to the pole that's the closest, in this case, to the origin. Does that help answer that question? So your poles are bounding your region of convergence. It's just where or how you define your region of convergence is what we will get to in the details. But I want you to understand these three different patterns for region of convergence. Yes? So the region of convergence is going to be symmetric with respect to the origin. It's always going to be a circle for pattern two. It will be a missing circle for pattern one, and it will be a donut for pattern three. It's always going to be symmetric with respect to the origin. Other questions? Let's get into the details of how can we now determine which pattern we have. And in particular, we could say that we are trying to motivate the region of convergence that we might have. Motivating the region of convergence. Here's what I'm trying to say. If someone gives you, let's say, capital X of Z equaling Z over Z minus one half, what can be said about little x of n. Pardon? It's right-sided is one comment. And I'm going to say that that could be correct. It may not be correct. It depends, right? That's what I'm going to say. We have to be told more information. You could supply the additional information, but with just this transform, capital X of Z, without anything else being given to you, you don't know what that looks like in terms of little x of n. It all depends on the region of convergence. But to answer this question, you could say, well, more information is needed. The reason is that the waveform type for little x of n, and by the type I'm meaning is it right-sided, is it left-sided, or is it two-sided? And I hope from the previous implications I, it's clear what those are, right-sided, left-sided, or two-sided. What type you have for little x of n depends on the region in the complex 
z prime where the z transform converges or where the z transform exists. And that really is this region of convergence. Meaning to uniquely specify little x of n, you need more than just capital X of z. You need the region of convergence also. Let's see how that arises. Suppose little x sub 1 of n, here is a time sequence, is 1 half to the n, but we want this for n negative. Little x sub 1 of n is 1 half raised to the n, but n now is taking on minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 for the argument. I think you can see what that translates into as far as a sequence of values for little x sub 1. If you evaluated x sub 1 at minus 1, what is that going to be? You raise one half to the minus one, or you say one over one half, and that's two, right? What about x sub one of minus two? Now we square one half, but it's one over one half squared. There's now four, and that just keeps going and going. Pictorially, if you wanted to sketch this, here's n, here's x sub 1 of n. We now have a value of 2, a value of 4, and a value of 8. And again, my sketch may not be very accurate, but I hope you get the picture of what's happening. This is a left-sided sequence because it was defined for negative values of n. Let's see if we can find the z transform of this. I hope it's clear that that's unbounded. And we're going to find that it actually has a z transform. Capital X sub 1 of z by definition, is this sum from n equal minus infinity to infinity of little x of 1, z to the minus n. But this is only true for, or x sub 1 of n is non-zero for negative indices on n. We could rewrite this and say this is the sum from n equal minus infinity up to minus 1 of one half to the n z to the minus n. Or we could even combine those two terms and by, let's say, keeping everything with a negative exponent if we wanted to, we could say, oh, this is n from minus infinity to minus 1 of 2z to the minus n. Since 2 to the minus n is really what we have when we have 1 half to the n. We could put that n down in the basement, and then we could pull it up if we wanted to by changing its sign of the exponent. This, we haven't changed anything. This is the definition of the z-transform, but now it's like, oh, I don't like those negative exponents. That's kind of odd. Well, you don't have to keep them. You can 
change your index. Let's let L equal minus N. Then we can say that capital X sub 1 of Z is going to be this sum. Now we're going from L equal 1 to infinity of 2Z to the L. Just by a change of variable. Yes. Pardon? So now what we've done is I've simply, well, it's maybe not clear from just showing you the bottom half or the result, but I hope it's clear that if you just expanded that top sum, maybe we start from the top and go to minus infinity, we would have a minus one, then a minus two, a minus three, and we've now converted that, those minuses, we've absorbed that into the L, so that now we have 2z to the 1, 2z to the 2, et cetera. So we have all of the same terms on the right-hand side of those two expressions. I hope that's clear. But you can now tell me when does this bottom piece going to exist? What do we know? We now, this is something that we're comfortable with. We're now summing these same pieces that are just, we now have a geometric series. We have 2z to the z 1, 2z to the 2, 2z to the 3. When do we know that that's going to be well-defined or well-behaved? What do we know has to be true for that sum to converge or for that sum to exist? What do we know has to happen? Z is a complex number, so we'll take the absolute value of 2Z and say that has to be less than 1. If that's true, then that sum will be okay, right? Because now we have something that's bounded by 1 and we're raising it to higher and higher powers, and that will eventually collapse, go to 0 as N goes to infinity in this sum. Well, this now actually provides us with a relationship on z. We could solve this for the absolute value of z. We could divide both sides by 2, so that now we have the absolute value of z is less than 1 half. This is our region of convergence. And do you see which pattern this falls into? All z such that the magnitude of z is less than one half. Which pattern? One, two, or three? I want you to show me your fingers. Wait a minute. Let me tell you when to show me a finger or fingers. Is it pattern one? Is it pattern two? Or is it pattern three? that this region of convergence corresponds to. I want the absolute value of z less than one half. One, two, three. Okay, it's two, isn't it? This is that inner disk. All values of z that have a magnitude less than one half. That's pattern two. And what is capital X sub 1 of Z? Well, we haven't determined that, but we can now based on what we have written down here because this is looking like something that we're used to playing with. We now have capital X sub 1 of Z. Oh, to make it easier, why don't I just call this W? <laughs> I'm playing with variables. I'll just throw another one in here. So this is now w to the 1 plus w squared plus w cubed, etc. We're just taking w and adding higher and higher powers. 
which if we wanted to do our trick that we've done before in terms of maybe finding a tail or tails that match, now it might be helpful to actually scale capital X sub 1 of Z by the inverse of W. If you now multiply that top row by W inverse, we now have a 1 plus a W plus a W squared plus a W cubed. And the tails of all of those match all of those. Those two rows, the tails in those two rows match. And the only difference is that 1, and if we subtract the bottom row from the top row, we now have 1 minus W inverse times X sub 1 of Z is equal to minus 1. Or capital X sub 1 of Z is equal to minus 1 over 1 minus W inverse. And we don't like things with negative exponents. We could multiply numerator and denominator by W, and we now have minus W over W minus 1. But W wasn't a part of our initial expression. W was 2Z. Let's put to Z or not to Z. Sorry, it's not a B, it's a Z. But never mind. We replace W with 2B. And now we can get closer to what we wanted, which is capital X sub 1 of Z. It's now minus 2Z over 2z minus 1, and a lot of times we don't like that way of expressing it. Maybe we want it just as z minus something. Factor out the 2 from the denominator and a 2 from the numerator. We end up with minus z over z minus 1 half. And when did this occur, or when was this true? When did this capital X sub 1 of z exist as long as the absolute value of z is less than one half. That we determined to make this sum true. This capital X sub 1 of z is then true as long as the absolute value of z is less than one half. Meaning we can now sketch this capital X1 of Z, which has this Z over Z minus one half flavor, maybe there's a sign change, but that I'm not going to argue about. Here is our Z plane. And you told me that we had pattern two. Here is our region of convergence. Where was our pole in this particular transform? It's right on the boundary, isn't it? It's right at one half, which is how big that circle is. We did have a pole or a zero there. We don't care about zeros. We just care about our poles in the region of convergence. And where is the unit circle? I would bring my compass, but I don't want to stick that sharp pin into my tablet and break my glass. So I won't draw that with a very accurate circle, but you can on your paper. That's the units. Ooh. It looks a lot better when I'm doing it right in front of me. Until I get into the audience, it looks pretty bad. But you can, that's a unit circle. Wow. And is the unit circle... Ah, that, boy, I hope your pictures look better than that. Even on the exam, even when you're stressed with the exam, I hope you can sketch better than that. But I'll be forgiving. 
where's the unit circle relative to the region of convergence? Is the unit circle contained within the region of convergence? Or is the red line in the shaded region? No. So that's something to keep in mind. Here are some observations we can make, make based on this particular example. Observations. What could you tell me about little x sub 1 of n, its time domain response? Was it bounded or unbounded? Do you remember? This is our response in time. It's going unbounded as little n goes more and more negative, isn't it? 2, 4, 8. It just keeps growing. Our time domain response is unbounded. So as a signal, it would be unbounded. As a system, we could call that an unstable system because it would grow unbounded. What did we learn about the region of convergence? The region of convergence does not contain the unit circle. And this is the connection between the region of convergence and stability. When that region of convergence does not contain, or that red line is not within the shaded region, then we have an unbounded waveform or signal. And finally, the last observation is that our region of convergence is interior to all poles. We only had one pole, but the region of convergence was inside that. Then a left sided time sequence, or x of n was not equal to zero, or n less than zero, and it was equal to zero by implication. That's maybe not clear, but I'm assuming from that comment that x of n is zero for n non-negative is what I'm meaning by that. Maybe I should explicitly say that and you could put that in your notes. Maybe I should. So I'm saying it's left-sided, which means this or x of, whoops, n of n, x of n is equal to zero for n greater than zero. Questions on that example? There is our picture, pattern two for the region of convergence. Do you see, though, how maybe we could have a pattern two that would produce a stable time response? Where would the pole have to be? Now what are you saying? You're wanting to grow that blue shaded region, expand it so that it now allows the red circle to live within it. Now if you had a pole, instead of at one half, you had a pole at two, or one and a half, or 1.1, you would have a bounded response, wouldn't you? in the time domain. Here, if you had a 2 to the minus 1, 2 to the minus 2, 2 to the minus 3, now you have 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, now the time response is bounded. If you had a pole at 2, take that away, or 
tuck that away and look at it at home tonight. Let's look at another one because we want to see can we find a Z transform that has this same kind of structure, Z over Z minus one half, for a different time sequence. Let's now suppose we have little x sub 2 of n equaling 1 half, but now let's let that n be non-negative. Is it clear what this looks like in the time domain? This is different from what we just had, isn't it? But let's now look at the Z transform of little x sub 2 of n, which is capital X sub 2 of Z. This is this sum from n equal minus infinity to infinity little x sub 2 of n, z to the minus n. But we can throw half of those n's away because n is greater than or equal to 0 for these, for x sub 2 of n, little x sub 2 of n. So we can say n equals 0 to infinity of 1 half to the n, z to the minus n. Or we could say, okay, this is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. Can I sort of combine these two pieces into one? And I can if I just put that z downstairs, and now I have 1 over 2z to the n. And when does this geometric series or when is it well behaved or when will it have a bounded result? When will this sum of these infinite terms be okay? What's the key? We want that argument to be less than one. We now need this one over two z be less than 1. And now we can chain, rewrite this to isolate z. We can multiply both sides by the absolute value of z. Or we can say that this is now 1 half is less than the absolute value of z. Or the absolute value of z is bigger than 1 half. Again, if you wanted to, we could say, well, this looks kind of messy. Let me just call that a W2. It's tax season, so now we have to worry about W2s. Hopefully it's beyond February 1, so you should have gotten your W2. Sorry. And you should know your W-2 because when's your exam? Wednesday. Right? Just, just a commercial. <clears throat> just a reminder, just to get, wake you up and make you nervous. We now have capital X sub 2 of Z is this 1 over 1 minus W-2 which we can now replace that W2 with what it really is, which is 1 over 2z. We can multiply both numerator and denominator by z. And now we have this same structure, z over z minus 1 half. I'm not worrying about the sign in the numerator. And when does this behave, or when is this true? For what values of z? 
as long as the absolute value of z is bigger than one half. And now what does the region of convergence look like? We have a pole at one half. We have a zero at the origin. Our region of convergence is there. And where's the unit circle? Now I'm shy to even sketch that. But I think you know where it is, right? Even with guidelines, my drafting teacher would be furious. But now I'm old enough, he probably is, never mind. Don't have to worry about that. And to be consistent, that's supposed to be a solid line, wasn't it? And I was shading or dashing my region of convergence. Even without my glasses, that looks pretty bad. But where is the region of convergence relative to or where is the unit circle relative to the region of convergence? Is it clear that that red line is lying in the shaded region that is a part of the region of convergence? Now we can make some observations like we made in the last example. What can we say about little x sub 2 of n as a time sequence? Was it bounded or unbounded? There's little x sub 2 of n. That was well behaved in terms of being bounded, wasn't it? It's shrinking with little n. So the time domain sequence x sub 2 of n is bounded. And if that corresponded to a system, we would say that that system was actually stable. And what can we say about the region of convergence? It contains the unit circle. And again, that's the connection that we can make between the region of convergence and stability or the bounded nature of our signal. And what do we know about the region of convergence relative to the poles? Is the region of convergence inside our poles? Is it outside our poles or is it annular relative to our poles? The region of convergence in this example is exterior to all of our poles, which says that we now have a right-sided sequence. I hope then that it's clear from these two examples that 
what capital X of Z equaling Z over Z minus one half corresponds to if we were to perform the inverse Z transform or what capital X of Z looks like as little x of n, what capital X of Z corresponds to in the time domain obviously depends on the region of convergence. Questions on that? relative to this example. What do we know about the region of convergence in our poles? As far as where those poles Lie relative to the region of convergence. What was our fact that we've talked about? The region of convergence never contains any poles, does it? Let's now look at, well, using that fact and just seeing what the possibilities are if we have more than one pole and only two poles, let's say. Let's look at different possibilities. For the region of convergence, even with as few as two poles. Suppose we had a pole at one half and a pole at three fourths. And now I say, oh, let's have our, wow, that's supposed to be a radius of three fourths. Suppose that this is. our region of convergence. We know the unit circle could just as well is right there. What can you tell me about the behavior of little x of n if you were given this picture? Or what would the structure of little x of n look like? Or here we have two poles. We have a pole at one half and a pole at three fourths. Which of those poles is the dominant pole? We only have two possibilities. The pole at one half and the pole at three fourths. Which of those two poles dominates your time domain response? Let me say one half is one finger, three fourths is three fingers. So I want you to give me one finger or three fingers at the count of three. Which of these poles dominates? One, two, three. see some twos. I shouldn't have seen an average. <laughs> oh, you're just in a good mood, huh? Which one is it? Three-fourths, isn't it? It's the pole that's closest to the unit circle is going to dominate in your response. Are these, is this going to be bounded time domain response? Can you tell me from this picture? 
based on what we've learned. And which sequence will this correspond to? Or which st type? Is it going to be a left-sided, a right-sided, or a two-sided? And how do we tell? Well, if we were looking at this in terms of, well, we said that the dominant pole If we said that this response was x of n, this might have a structure of, let's say, alpha 1, 1 half to the n plus alpha 2, 3 fourths to the n. The dominant pole was this slowest pole, the pole closest to the unit circle. And is this true for... So let's just concentrate on that three-fourths and say that I wanted to find, maybe I call this x sub b, and this was x sub a of n. If I now looked at capital X sub b of z, and I said, oh, that's this sum from n equal minus infinity to infinity of x sub b to the n, z to the minus n, and I started plugging in different values. Maybe I said, oh, I'm coming up from small negative values. I'm now at x b of minus 2, z to the minus minus 2, plus x sub b of minus 1, z to the minus minus 1, plus x sub b of 0, z to the minus 0, plus x sub b of 1, z to the minus 1, plus x sub b of 2, uh, I have an infinitely wide page, z to the minus 2, etc. Can you tell me if some of those terms belong or don't belong based on the region of convergence? What does the region of convergence mean? That means that if I pick any point out here, how do I want to draw this? Let me say I just pick that point right there. There's a Z, and it's in the region of convergence. If I picked that Z, that value of Z is supposed to allow this infinite sum to exist. I now have x sub b of minus 2, z squared, right? And I have x sub b of minus 1, z. So I have z, z squared, z cubed with all of these negative indexed x sub b's. But that point that I drew, I could go as far as I want. That region of convergence extends to infinity, doesn't it? So I could just say, let z go off to infinity. And now I have z squared. Ooh, does that allow that sum to be bounded? Even for z, if z is infinite, x sub b to the minus 1 times infinite means that that would not be part of that well-behaved sum, would it? All of these x sub b's with negative indices have to be zero in order for that region of convergence to be true. Is that clear? To infinity and beyond. wherever that came from. But if you let z go get really, really big, is it clear that you would ha you're would you forcing this term, this term, and all of these other terms to equal zero? Otherwise, that sum would not be well-behaved. It wouldn't be bounded. Is that clear? And now you are showing or 
demonstrating that for this picture and for that z going off to infinity, you now know what kind of a sided sequence you have. The only terms in the time domain sequence that can be non-zero are the ones that have non-negative indices. X sub b of zero, x sub b of one, x sub b of two. This region of convergence being outside of all of the poles says that little x sub n is causal or x of n is equal to zero for all n less than zero. Now being causal and being bounded are two different things. We could have had that outer pole instead of being at three-fourths, maybe it was at two. And our region of convergence is outside of two, which allows our sum to converge. But what happens to our time domain behavior? We now have two to the first, two squared, two cubed. What's happening to that pole at two? It's going unbounded. Our sequence is causal. We have a Z transform. So this causality and stability are not connected either, or they don't have to be consistent. You can have an unbounded causal sequence. You can now, in this case, what do you have? You have a causal bounded time domain sequence just from this picture, showing you the poles and the region of convergence. What I need you to do, maybe after the exam, is to start, whoops, oh, that clock threw me off. So I still have some time. Wall clocks, what good are they? Questions on this example? Oh, I was supposed to be showing you the different possible regions of convergence for two poles, wasn't I? And I sort of got off on this. Do you see that I could have a different picture? I could have that picture and I want you to now go home and convince yourself that that corresponds to what sided of a sequence. Write down all of your terms, maybe not an infinite number, but some of those around zero and say x sub something have in z to the minus minus. This is going to be a left-sided sequence. Is it stable? Where's your unit circle? That's not in your region of convergence, is it? So that's an unbounded time domain waveform because you have one half and three fourths being raised to negative, higher and higher negative powers. So effectively you have two, two squared, two cubed, et cetera, in the negative, or the, yeah, the negative indexed values. Again, what are some other patterns? Now we have a one half, oops, I changed colors. Now I do have to be a little bit better, maybe. I wanted to make those consistent with my earlier sketches. Now we have a region of convergence that's annular or inside one pole and outside of another. The one half 
corresponds to what side of a sequence? Is it a causal or anti-causal? One half is anterior to the region of convergence. You would now have one half to the n for non-negative values of n. The three-fourths, the region of convergence is inside it. It's now the anti-causal. Now you have three-fourths going off in the negative piece. This is now a two-sided sequence. Where's the unit circle? Outside that annular region. So is, is this time domain sequence stable or bounded or unbounded? You don't even have to know what it's doing. You can say what? It's unbounded because that red circle is not in the region of convergence. We'll pick up at that after exam number one.